uh, Google acquired, I've been talking to you about using these deep nets for image recognition and for um, speech recognition. Uh, one of, um, so this professor in Toronto, Jeff Hinton, with two of his students um, have been doing this and they created a small company about a year ago. Um, they were just acquired by Google. So Google's very interested in this technology. It's not just cool research to do with the brain, but it's um, actually research that is practical in making an uh, immediate impact. We're actually, I'm going to go through some of the ideas of what they were doing there. Oh, one, one last thing. One of the things that I haven't done, covered in this class, because I'm focusing on images, is I haven't really covered um, a neural networks for language and neural network for other applications. Um, but I want you to be aware that it's not just images. I've just chosen images so that I can show you pictures and it's easy to understand the pictures because vectors of words are hard to sometimes visualize. Um, but also for language, you can use neural networks to predict sequences and to learn to predict sequences. And they actually, you can actually build some very good language models with these. Um, so what, what is shown here is a student um, named Byron Knoll, uh, who, uh, an ex-student of mine who now works at Google. And what he did was he, you know, he trained his neural net and so on. Um, it's a neural net with some other memory devices. And when he starts typing a sentence, he typed the word M, and it automatically uh, completes the sentence. Okay, so that text that you're seeing there, that's not a human, that's machine generated. That's a neural network generating that text. And if this was trained in Moby Dick, in the book of Moby Dick, hence the kind of language that you get. Um, this other one was trained in the latex source of Kevin Murphy's book, the, the one that I recommended for this um, course. And as you can see, it's actually pretty good at doing latex. It can even decide when to open uh, bracket, um, a Gaussian distribution, mu, gamma. It's kind of sensible. They're very sensible predictions. And hence why these models are cool, because you can actually, they, they can actually learn language. All right, <clears throat> going back to images. So um, to recap, um, in that last class we saw that um, what we're going to be doing is essentially building a neural network and so the input to, you can think of the input to each unit, to each neuron will be a patch and then each uh, pixel in that patch is essentially an input. Like in this case there are four lines. If you imagine four pixels there, those would be the four inputs and each input gets weighted by a parameter and then it goes through an activation function like a sigmoid. And so the output of the neuron is 0, 1. And there's many ways in which you can do this. Um, we can do, because images, HD images are very large, just the same as we, with our eye, we can't absorb the whole thing, so we just sample it at a few places. Uh, with these networks, you also tend to sample the image and just work with patches. Um, we sort of abstract that and we just basically now consider just a single patch. So imagine that the input is a single patch. For example, the patch could be um, a face and these are the pixels that describe a face. And so the, the key element in building these architectures is this model that we call autoencoders. And an autoencoder is just a neural network. Um, you can think of it as a logistic neural network like we did um, two classes ago. And you can train it with back propagation. Um, that is just by doing gradient descent. Um, and it's done such that there is this, a bottleneck so that the, the network is asked to predict its, uh, the input. So you feed to the network uh, two copies of the same image. 
And the network has to be able to, given that image, be able to predict it. Okay, so if, uh, if the network learns to reconstruct the world, then you hope that since it has a brain that has less storage than the world, and yet it can reconstruct the world, it's because it has captured the things that are important about the world that allow it to reconstruct the world. And to each unit here, there is each input, each pixel, goes into one of the hidden units, one of these green circles. And each pixel has a weight. Um, so when we visualize um, that weight, so if we look at all the connections in coming into a neuron, um, you can, because the input is an image patch, the weight is the size of the input, so we can also visualize all the weights as an image. And when we visualize it, oops, sorry. When we visualize it, we see things like this. So we see weights that, for example, detect edges. Like this is, um, think of it as a filter. It, it searches in the image, and where it finds an image, a region that is lighter next to an image that is darker, you know, where there's contrast between two regions of the image, which is what happens at an edge. Um, <coughs> then that neuron fires. So that if you're, when you're in test time, if you have a new test data that consists of two edges, and if you've trained it so that two units can match these edges, um, then, you'll, then you'll get this neuron firing, the three neurons firing, say 101, to indicate that it's detecting these two edges in the input. Okay? And then what we need is another um, so essentially what this model is doing is it's extracting the features. You basically are saying, what is this image made out of? What edges constitute this image? And you're getting a binary vector telling you what the edges are. So this is a hash for the image, basically. It's a, and in fact, that's one, one of the patterns that Jeff has is on, on doing this, sort of hashing images by using neural networks. And of course, if you have a binary hash, it becomes extremely easy just via hand operations to do image search on the web. So you can very efficiently do large scale image retrieval once you've converted the images to this hash. And even if some features are not present because someone might have closed their eye or, or whatever other reason, you still will be able to detect near duplicates. Oh, okay, good, excellent question. So PCA is a linear technique. The PCA does exactly um, something similar to this. So if you had no regularizer, um, and um, let me actually bring the equation because it makes it very clear. Okay, so, so I also argued before fully answer your question that the objective function that we're trying to optimize with these models is essentially um, minimize the difference between x hat, which if you had a linear model, would be w times x, and then w transpose times um, a. So in other words, x hat is w times x, and then w transpose times x. Wx is what we call a or the, the vector of activations um, in the hidden layer. Um, so we're trying to minimize the difference between x, which is the true output image, and x hat, which is the prediction of the network. So x hat is what you imagine this classroom looks like with your eyes closed. x is what you observe. And you're just basically trying to match those two differences. If there was no extra term, if there was no regularizer, um, that would be exactly PCA. Because PCA, um, I haven't covered it in this course, but in 340, um, there was, there's a slide there in 340, if you look back, that says that if you're trying to minimize the difference between X and um, if you try to minimize the difference between a matrix and the product of two matrices, those two matrices will end up being the 
U sigma and then the V transpose matrix. So it will give you the SVD. So it will give you exactly PCA. Okay, so if, if you just have linear units, um, you'll do PCA. Um, in terms of basis functions, um, the basis functions that we get here, they tend to be like this. They tend to detect edges. And they tend to only happen, the interesting things are only happening in a small region of the space. There are a few global basis functions like this one here. But most basis functions are local. Whereas the PCA basis, as you found out in 340, they tend to be more like sinusoids. And they're all global because sinusoids either will be one period of the sinusoid, two periods, three periods. They're more like a Fourier series representation. This gives you a local representation. PCA is a global representation. Local representations are nice because you're describing objects in terms of parts. And if some parts are missing, you can still recognize as the object. That, um, and that's the nice thing about these models, actually, as well that um, when you have a model of this form, uh, a part model, and suppose you have three units, um, um, three hidden units, which means you have a feature vector with three entries. If the A's are binary, then this allows you to talk about two to the three things. Okay, so the nice thing about this is that this representation it's actually combined, uh, it's actually it has exponential storage. Whereas if you do things in machine learning like clustering, which is bending things into groups, then something can only be one of k groups. So, so that's one possible way of describing students. Say the students can be out of uh, k groups. They can be, I don't know, A students, B students, C students, D students, and so on. Um, so that's a very coarse representation. Um, this representation is about properties of the student. So if you have k units, you can talk about two to the k properties of the student. So every time you get a student, you can say things about the student. The student does well in the homework. The student um, sleeps in class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and that's essentially what we call a distributed representation versus like neuroscientists think of this as a distributed representation which has this nice exponential power of memory versus a clustering or wouldn't take all representation which is also a common model in neuroscience that I don't think is as cool as this one. Okay, so um, and then of course we saw that the idea of training it unsupervised is that basically what we get out of this in a completely unsupervised way is that we learn this type of graph here which allows us to go from an input image which is very high dimensional to a very small hash vector for that, Im for that image which allows us to do quickly efficient search um, and allows us to do many other things. Um, but certainly one of the interests of Google is being able to get hashes for YouTube because video takes a lot of storage and if you can hash video um, you can do video search and not only develop new products but you can make the, the way you manage data a lot more efficient. And once you've learned these, once you've learned this representation in a supervised way um, you can also take these as features that you can feed into a classifier. So when I've taught you linear regression and logistic regression and so on, there was always an assumption that we had the inputs, the attributes, or the features. Uh, but a lot of times, and you're finding that in the project, you're looking at EEGs, you're looking at um, arrays, you're looking at whatever you're looking at, text, um, a lot of your effort is trying to figure out what will be my features. Okay. Building classifiers, that's something we teach you in this course, um, like random force and so on, and it's a skill that you need to have, and you need to understand that in order to do machine learning. But in terms of machine learning research, that's not like the hot thing. There's lots of classifiers out there. You go to scikit-learn, or you go to any other package on the web, you know, if you 
you go to PMTK if you want to do it in MATLAB, you go to WEC if you want to do this in Java. Wherever you go, there's a lot of these classifiers have been implemented. There's a lot of software. Um, but in terms of techniques to extract features automatically from data, that's what you won't find much. And that's really where the challenge is, is figuring out what are the features. So what makes this area pretty hot is because it allows us to extract features from images or from text um, and, and hopefully from other signals. Now, once we have the features, then it becomes easy to build a sort of logistic classifier and be able to build different type of um, classifications. Okay, so the other thing we discussed was the regularizer and I mentioned that typically this regularizer, cons is the function g in this regularizer is just the L1 absolute value and the reason has to do with this as well um, because w um, that regularizer um, will be more clear in the last week that regularizer says you wj times xi is just the output of neuron j and so what we're saying is don't let all the neurons fire. We're penalizing, the way to minimize this cost in order to minimize over W both terms, um, you first need to, the, with the first term, we're trying to minimize the difference between this guy here which is just x hat, the prediction, minus the actual x. So we're trying to minimize this difference. Um, but in order to minimize this, you basically could minimize it by making some of this term zero. Okay, if you pick the wj, some of the wj's to be zero, then that term will be minimized. And of course there's a trade-off, which usually we we find by doing cross-validation. So often we have a regularizer. And the regularizer this time was placed here. So this is the sort of lambda you would use. You would cross-validate just like you did in your, in your homework before. Um, but here instead of putting the regularizer on the weights, we're putting the regularizer on the, on the neurons. So we're not asking for the synapse to be on and off what we're asking is for a neuron to be entirely on or off. And so there was this important interpretation that you could swap the sum and either have it starting with i or starting with j. And essentially what this is saying is that for a particular feature, for a particular j, you only want some data sets to fire. So you want a feature, sorry, the other way around. You want that feature to fire only for a few data sets. Okay, so I might have a neuron that is a good neuron that I only want that neuron to fire when I see a human. I don't want that neuron to fire for other representations. Because um, if I, you know, it would be redundant otherwise. It wouldn't be a useful neuron. Likewise, for a particular data set, um, I don't want too many features to fire. You know, I don't want my whole brain to fire when I see something. I only want some features to fire and that all, again, helps me distinguish different things in the world. Different sounds, different people, etc. Um, so that's the basic, then these are the two basic ingredients in the model. Um, a not encoder requires that you minimize reconstruction error. And then it also requires that you put in a regularizer um, that achieves these properties. That gives you basically, if you think of the data by features matrix, think of it as sparse. Um, and then of course I mentioned that in addition to using a linear autoencoder, I argue that you could just replace the linear with the logistic unit and then you would have a nonlinear autoencoder. 
great amount of effort is dedicated to solving this optimization problem. So if you're doing research in optimization, this is a very cool problem. If you can find structure in this problem and solve it more efficiently, um, then you, you'll, that will lead to great progress in the field. Same as with the people doing randomized algorithms. Can you think of doing using randomization here to improve this calculation? That's also a very challenging problem. Um, and it's one that uh, you know, should have high reward. OK. We then also talked about, um, and the reason I'm revising all this from last class is because when I, I'm about to talk about the Google network and it uses all these um, ideas. Um, we then talked about complex cells. So the idea of a complex cell um, um, is as follows. A complex cell, well let's first look at simple cells. So simple cells is what we've been looking at. A simple cell will activate, so this unit will activate just as before. In other, uh, in other words, that unit is just a linear combination of all the input pixels. Okay, in other words, A equal W times X. Um, a complex cell takes the output of the simple cell. So this guy would be the simple. And this would be the complex cells. And these are truly motivated by, uh, by the biology, where we have, uh, where scientists have researched and found these simple and complex cell uh, properties in studying visual cortex in some mammals. So the complex cell uses a set of H's that is fixed. And soon we'll actually see an example of H where H is just the identity matrix. Um, and it basically squares the inputs, adds them, and takes the square root. So it's like an L2 norm. Um, and then it generates an output. Okay, and when we look at um, now the Google network, Google uses an autoencoder that is very similar to essentially the simple complex cell. It just has one more thing, and that one more thing is sort of easy to understand. It's just contrast normalization, which is something you've, you've all done in this course as well. You subtract the mean and you divide by the variance to make all features have the same scale so that they're comparable. Um, and so the Google Net basically, um, you take an image patch and then there are eight neurons that look at the same image patch. And the reason why you want more than one neuron to look at the same image uh, patch is because um, an image patch could contain several different kinds of edges. So you want to be able to capture all of them. And so that's why there is a sort of number of maps being equal to eight. And now each unit, each of these eight units, looks at one patch of the image. And the main reason why this is done this way is because of computation. You could have a unit look at the whole image, but that would, you know, the, this network ends up having millions of parameters because each of these edges, if you have an image that's 200 by 200, and you have a thousand units. Now you have something that's four thousand by a four thousand two hundred by two hundred by a thousand. Um, that gives you four million parameters. So very quickly, these models get out of um, the sort of scale that you can handle in the computer easily. Uh, GPU programming is essential here. Unless you're Google, you really have to rely on GPUs. And for using GPUs to program, this, these days there's all sorts of good tools. Like um, these guys that were just acquired by Google, they've actually developed uh, a lot of very nice software that you can get from their home pages um, to use to implement neural networks. Um, okay, so, um, so then because of that computation, then also each group of eight units only looks at the patch. And then you make the patches overlapping to avoid image artifacts. 
once you have, and that's your simple network, so this is where W is here, and these are your activations, this is your X, and then you just need to do that basically gives you this first term here. So the idea is you, you're going to set the W so that the reconstruction of going from X to A and then back to X um, allows you to, uh, going from X to A and then back down allows you to get something that's very close to X so as to minimize the reconstruction. Yes, that's correct. So um, typically we have just W and W transpose, so we, we just use the same W um, and tie the weights. Um, the Google guys, and I took this equation from their paper, this is verbatim copied from their paper to make the case that they're not using even a nonlinear neural network, but they, what's published is a linear neural network. I don't know if they're using nonlinear, but at least that's what was published. Um, and they, in their paper, they argue for using two different Ws, if I recall correctly, because of computation. Somehow, because of the way they implemented their optimizer, it was more efficient to do it this way. Um, I actually don't know exa the exact details of that. I don't think they're well spelled out in the paper right. And then finally, there is this matrix H. And I've mentioned that researchers have many forms for this matrix. Uh, in fact, some people don't even use a matrix there, but they just basically pick for a patch. So they take several inputs um, going into one of the complex cells, and some people just will pick um, the unit that is excited the most. Or they might even choose H to be just the identity, as I will show you soon. And then the epsilon is just something that, they, again, they added there for numerical stability. So if, if we look at this term, this is essentially the output of a complex cell. Um, so the, the whole model, it's hard to break into a likelihood and a, uh, and a prior as such. Um, because you could argue that it's the second term that really is um, the likelihood that's actually telling you how the signal gets transformed. And this is just a prior. And the prior here, our prior knowledge is that the reconstructions <coughs> by our model should look like the data that our model looks at. That's essentially the, the knowledge that we've encoded in this model. Um, it nonetheless is kind of tricky to think of this because it's a data dependent prior if you look at it that way. I think from a statistical perspective this, some, this raises some questions. And that's pretty much the model. And then the final stage is just this local contrast normalization which I will review now. Um, okay, but basically um, let's look at these in the context of um, the Google Net. Um, these slides I got from Marco Aurelio Ranzato, who was um, uh, previously a postdoc in Toronto. He was one of uh, the co collaborators in several, several papers here with our students. Um, and he's now one of the leading researchers on, the, on this brain project at Google. Um, so he has these very cool slides, which essentially he's saying how they implement the pooling and the contrast normalization. So in pooling, you just take a patch of the previous layer of neurons. And then for that patch, you essentially would take all the activations in that patch, square them, sum them, take the square root. That gives you the activation at this new location, x, y. Um, and then contrast normalization, essentially you take the patch on the previous layer, um, you compute the mean of the pixels and you compute the standard deviation and then you just subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And this paper describes very clearly what all these stages are. The standard deviation is that for the image or for the patch? For the patch. Okay. So it's hence, hence the local. So contrast normalization right. is just subtracting. So you're going to do, these operations are done per patch. Uh, 
So as you can see here, a pulling unit only sees one particular patch. And again, you use overlapped patches to avoid artifacts. So very much like very much like we had seen in this in this picture. So we use what there'll be one set of patches, another set of patches, and then another set of patches like that. So that allows you to cover the whole image. Or if you will, cover all the neurons. As you go up these nets, you can still interpret um, as you go up, you can still interpret these as images. So each layer here is still an image, but it will be images at different resolutions and so on. And there will be images that highlight, some of them will be like transformations. There will be images where you see the, the edges will be high intensified, so like edge maps and so on. Um, and eventually some of these units at the top where they start, will start putting together subunits and you'll start seeing patches of neurons that essentially are detecting noses and eyes and uh, stuff like that when you, when you train it with faces. Um, right, so, so, so those operations are per patch and same as for local contrast normalization except that in this case they were actually using um, well they were using patches of size 5 neurons and I don't know uh, how many replicates of these they would have had. Uh, the, for the details you'd have to look at the, the Google paper. I'm assuming that for some layers they would have had. In this case there's only one patch because of the drawing but in implementation I assume there would have been several patches. So, okay. uh, do these patches overlap or not? Oh, they do overlap, like in the picture. Uh, yeah, they do overlap as well. As you can see, this patch goes all the way here and then this patch goes all the way here. So these two patches um, clearly overlap. Like normalizing Oh, in the contrast normalization, I think they would also overlap. I don't know the answer 100% for sure. You'll have to check the paper for details. But based on the way they're doing it, I, I, would, I think to avoid artifacts, you would want them to overlap as well. In this case, they have, well, actually, in this case, it's sort of clear that they do overlap, in fact. I think this is just one thing. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. And this drawing, um, but I think it's just because of the size of the drawing. It's very hard to draw this. There's only one patch, but you could have several patches. And hence why local, because you're only contrast normalizing at the local patch, as opposed to over the entire image. Um, now, local contrast normalization, pooling, filtering, these are all principles that have been derived from neuroscience. It's from measurements, uh, measurements of uh, how neurons fire for some mammals have sort of guided the design of these neural networks. So it's one of those areas where work in most sort of mathematical work in optimization and you know in the work of computer scientists and statisticians um, who study these models and the work of neuroscience sort of comes together and you're able to build a model that really starts sort of building on some of the most intelligent machines that we know in nature which is basically animals and um, allows us to um, you know build some very powerful, de powerful devices and, and so the story then is very simple so you just have a patch um, you just take the square of the differences and the normalization and here's an illustration why they work. Suppose, um, so I argue that the idea of pooling is that if you apply some small transformation, although rotation, to an object, if it's in your visual field and you apply a small transformation, you would like the complex cell to still fire. In other words, you want the, uh, the neuron to be invariant to perturbations in the date. And as this sort of exaggerated picture shows you, um, if the input was this guy here, um, this patch, 
sorry. Oh, there we go. So if you had this as the patch in the input, if it was something that was like, you know, this caricature, something that's half graze, half white, if that thing was rotated, you would still want to somehow detect that that thing exists. And so, um, in this case, um, if, if this is the input, then in a particular patch of neurons, a group of neurons, it might be that this first neuron will fire and because it's anti-correlated, in other words, it's lighter when it's dark and dark when it's light, it might fire minus one. The other neurons don't look like this, so they don't fire. Now when you sum the five neurons in the patch, square them, and take the square root, you just get a one, right? Because it's one squared plus zero squared. If that patch gets rotated, it still sort of ca is matched by one of the neurons in the bank. And so the output of the complex cell is still the same. Okay, so if these units, if these units here, I just look, have captured the various rotations of this object, then it really doesn't matter then in which orientation the, uh, the object is. I, the same unit up here will fire. So it captures invariance with respect to perturbations of the input. And that's essential because as we observe the world, the world comes at us in all sorts of distortions all the time. And hence why we can never program a computer exactly to see. Um, so the message here is L2 pooling. It's using the squared L2 norm. Um, sorry, using this L2 norm. Um, it helps us with learning representations that are robust to these small perturbations. Normalization has a similar effect. Um, if you have inputs and you just take the mean of all these guys and the standard deviation, which is to and divide them, you know, subtract the mean from all of them and divide by the standard deviation, you get an output that says scale to, to these green values. If your input were to be in a different scale, when you add those numbers, divide by the variance, you would get the same green values. So no matter what the scale of the input, you would still get the same um, output firings of the neurons. Um, so if you're looking at me and I switch on a bright light, you would still recognize it's me, even though the light intensity went up tenfold. And so by doing contrast normalization, you essentially um, are getting um, invariance with respect to the intensity of the variations in light intensity. I'm wondering uh, if you go back one slide. Is that yeah. That's it. I'm wondering, is there anything that encourages groups of neurons that represent different rotations to then be grouped together at a higher level? Yes. So I I skip talking about that, but uh, one of um, what I mean that's something that's going to take a bit more time. Um, office hours, uh, I can actually talk about that. There's, there's a longer argument. But one of the things that we actually get from having these, L1, these group L1 norms is that we also can construct them so that we actually get topographic maps. So that we get um, basically neurons that tend to have the same type of pattern grouped together. The argument is a bit more involved, so I'm gonna I can cover it in the office hour. And that we observe in the brain as well. There's the topography in the brain, this certain organization. Okay, so um, contrast normalization and L2 pooling essentially help us with invariance. And that's, very, that's essential. In order to recognize speech, each of you has a slightly different way of saying a particular phoneme. It's essentially that the network be invariant to those perturbations. All right, so let's look at um, the cool work that uh, Google did last year. Um, and by Google, I mean um, people like Quokle and Andrew Ng, Marco Aurelio, um, Jeff Dean, who's one of 
uh, I, I keep hearing one of the best programmers alive that's working this uh, problem right now. And they were after what was found in neuroscience experiments. Um, so in this neuroscience experiment here that appeared in Nature, they basically found these cells that tend to fire when you present to the cell pictures of Halle Berry. Uh, even if they're cartoons. So that's, so it seems to indicate that, well, somewhere in the brain there are these cells that will fire when you identify Halle Berry. One of your course projects is actually to do this, to actually, in fact, um, show that there are some cells in the brain that are coding for plants. And that's the data set that Maria um, shared with you guys and asked you guys to fit and then try to do bootstrapping to evaluate the quality of the fit. Um, it's to those of us who believe that it, everything is down to a machine, <laughs> a biological machine, this is not surprising. It's all encoded in the brain. But to the vast majority of people, um, to be able to convince them that you could actually build a machine that can actually uh, is capable of mimicking this, um, is, uh, is nonetheless a, a formidable challenge. And that's what um, Andrew Ng did with his group. Um, so what they um, decided to do was they took a very large data set of YouTube image, uh, images, each of size 200 by 200, and there's uh, 10, um, 10 million um, unlabeled frames, so 10 million images. Um, the total network has about 1 billion parameters. Okay, so 1 billion is the sort of thing that starts becoming very hard to train or even to load in memory. Their deep net consists of three layers. So as I said last week, the basic unit in deep learning is an autoencoder. You train an autoencoder to predict the input. Once you've done that, you look at the second layer and you train another autoencoder to predict the second layer. And then you train another autoencoder to predict the third layer and you go for as many layers as you wish. Of course, there's a lot of questions here. How many layers? How many units? What should the value of lambda be? Uh, what should be the form of pooling that I use? And that's where Bayesian optimization actually comes in beautifully. Because you can actually automate all this and have this meta decision process that com completely configures a neural network. And, and in fact, there's been some papers that have addressed this. So James Bergstra, uh, more recently, um, um, Jasper Snook and, and, and colleagues, Ugola Rochelle, uh, Ryan Adams, they've kind of all developed uh, Bayesian optimization schemes to tune these parameters. Um, now, each stage, each autoencoder, uh, so the deep net consisted of three autoencoders, three stages, and for each stage, they use these 18 by 18 filters. So that's the simple cells. That's just a simple neural network, if you will, um, with eight units at each location. So at Im for each image patch, there will be eight neurons looking at that image patch, or eight filters. Um, they use L2 pulling. They use um, local contrast normalization over five by five uh, neighborhoods. So five by five image patches, or if you go higher up, five by five neuron patches. And then what they do actually, they try, they actually put all these together. And, it's, and so here's the interesting, because they, um, they said they will train all of these jointly. So instead of training in a greedy wise manner, as many groups do, they decided to just rely on some hardcore optimization and use, I think, 16 million cores and so on to distribute the computation, just because they happen to have that power. And they decided to um, train the whole thing. So just write the objective function for the three layers, basically add those objectives, crunch the optimization technique on these. And so in doing that, they have to be smart, because they have to decide how they're going to distribute the data across different machines, and they also have to distribute the parameters. So for people doing distributed computation, 
to surface actually quite an interesting problem. And that's pretty much it. So a single autoencoder has the filtering stage, the, the simple cells that is, it has the complex cells, which is the L2 pulling stage, and then it just has this normalization step, um, subtract by the mean, divide by the variance. And the total network consists of three stages like the top stage, one, two, three. Now, how do they validate the results? Um, so what they did um, is they constructed a test set or a validation set which had 50% faces, 50% random. And then they check how, well do, how do the neurons do in this case. Now this is non, this sort of validation here is not easy because essentially you've taken um, millions of images, you've threw this huge network at the images and you train this network to reconstruct its input. Okay, so one way to measure performance would be by how well it reconstructs the input. Um, but then you wouldn't want a machine that just is capable of reconstructing the input. You want this machine to do something special, to do something different. Um, could it be that this network has learned what a face is? Or what a kitty is? And those were the two things that it learned. It learned what faces are, it learned what cats are because I guess that's what you find in YouTube, plenty. Um, and so precisely what they did was that then they took these, they took different kind of images, some of faces, some not of faces, they fed it through the network, and then for each neuron, they did the following test. Let's say we grab one single neuron, and then for that neuron, we see how many times it fires What's, uh, what's its firing, you look at all its firing rates, possible firing rates, and you count how many times, how, for how many face images did it fire at a particular um, firing rate. And so you get things like, for faces, these tend to be the activations, so the most common activation is around minus 0 0.4, whereas for images of non-faces it tends to be active with mean around five. So if you use these two empirical histograms of the firing of the neuron, you can see that this neuron is actually differentiating. It selectively fires differently for whether the input is a face or not a, or not a face. So this, new, this particular neuron has learned. By doing this in a supervised, we've actually been able to extract structure in the data. And one of the structures is, here is a neuron that detects faces. And that's quite cool. Okay, um, how many neurons do they have in total? Oh, um, can one figure it out from this easily? Um, so they claim what one billion parameters? Um, Okay, it's, I'm terrible with arithmetic, but it's just an exercise of arithmetic. Um, you have 200 by 200, and then you have, uh, for, for the patch of size 25, you have 18. In other words, if you do these calculations for the, the sizes, you'll be able to figure it out. Uh, with one billion, it's millions of neurons. The exact number you could sort of calculate just by adding and multiplying these numbers. Um, but I think where your question is going is the how, how does this, comp this huge network, how does this compare to the brain of, never mind a human, a mouse? It's insignificant. We really are still at the stage where what we can do with our computers is still, our, is still much of a much smaller scale than our brains. Um, like just our optic nerve has a million fibers going in through. That's a thousand by a thousand image. So it's a much higher resolution than the images that these guys are using. Our patches are very large. Our patches are a thousand by a thousand pixels. So we're still very far from um, capturing what we have. 
if there's if there are that many neurons, then would some of the other neurons in there also respond to specific things in the images as well? Like not just faces, but some. So they they did study what did they respond to. And the ones that I, they reported was faces and so on. So they haven't reported more results um, in a completely here conjectured simply because they weren't able to. I think if they had more interesting signals, they probably would have reported us. Since then, there's been other groups that have been able to, using simpler techniques, recreate these results, by the way. Is it possible that there's also another type of image that they didn't consider that would fire the same way as for faces? Oh, that's a very good question. Could you have a different kind of images that when applied to that neuron would have caused that? Um, possibly. Because here all they did was let's so take all our data for validation and at least they know that in terms of validation, um, there does not appear, based on these results, to be any other uh, neuron that, uh, any other kind of image that would have that property. But if you were to consider a bigger data set to test it, it could be quite the case. But let me show you the rest of the evidence before we draw any conclusions. Um, they looked at which, they then looked at which are the images from this data set, which is not only faces but several things, out of all the images in this data set, which are the ones that tend to make this unit fire the most? And this is what they found those images were. So from here it seems clear that other things would not necessarily be good at making it fire. But of course, as you can see here, there's an image of a mouse. That's not a face. That still makes that neuron fire. Um, the other thing that they do which I think to a large extent answers your question is um, you have a neural network, okay, which is implements the function f which takes the input x and it has parameters w and h. h are fixed, w we learn, and it produces some output. So what you might do then do is you turn the neuron on, so you make the output on, and for those weights you try to figure out what is the input. You know, what is the input that makes this neuron be on? And so in other words, you solve this operation. Find the input that maximizes the firing of this neuron. Yeah. And so in other words, you're now computing what would be the input image that would maximally cause this neuron to fire. And when they do that, this is what they get. Okay, this is the sort of the, the scary um, quintessential image of the face that's causing that neuron to fire. So that somehow is kind of saying that this neuron indeed is tuned to faces. Um, where is the neuron located? Is it at the third stage or first stage? Is oh, it this one I believe it's at the third stage. And it's a complex, not simple. Yeah, it will be the result of, so each, each stage consists of a, um, simple and complex cells and then contrast normalization. So this would be after three stages of simple complex normalization, simple complex normalization, simple complex normalization. So it might be that with, if you look at the neurons at the first stage, there might be a neuron that does it for us. For yeah, they, they typically, when you look at the first stage, the weights, they typically tend to be just like lines. And so, so you really need layers because the idea is the first neurons is, are just detecting edges. They tend to just like respond to images that look like edges, like the ones that I've shown you. But if you now take an image on top, that image, that neuron in the second layer will, will fire for combinations of edges. And because of pooling, it will be at a lower resolution. So now it could be firing for say a square or so. And at higher levels, then it starts putting together combinations of those. So, so essentially it's useful to think of these as park models, where the first layer is basically breaking the image into parts, and then the next layers are sort of grouping the parts to synthesize objects like these. <laughs>
Um, the other thing that Google guys did is they studied invariance and so for example they found that um, you know they did experiments like what happens if you move the image left and right and up and down and so if you move and then and then they check whether the neuron is still firing and then as you can see by moving it um, it's still fairly robust so you can move, if you move it just a little bit the same unit will still fire same with vertical um, and then they have experiments with rotation and scale um, I do not know um, I haven't asked them this question I do not know if they try to comp match this with biological with psychophysical experiments because we humans are very good at when things move like this up and down you take a car and move it up and down left right and it's still a car but if you rotate it um, we have more difficulty in recognizing that it's still a car rotated cars cause trouble it all depends on the object too like objects that are naturally rotated would be fine with but we don't see yeah. upside down cars context matters a lot so these models actually are not because they're just looking at these patches they're not actually taking so much into consideration context one of the things that's very interesting about other models like random forest the problem with random forest is you, we can't build layers with random forest you can, if you can figure out how to do that in a course project that's well that's your thesis um, but so we can't build layers but on the other hand with random forest especially if you look at the section of regression in Antonio Cremonese's report uh, when you do regression with random forest or in fact when you do classification as well for connect um, context is used the pictures that like when you when in their experiments they try to predict in their medical images they try to predict whether a particular organ is located they actually use the other organs to provide evidence for where the other organ will be in the image so they're using contextual information that to me is kind of important um, and doing that with a neural network would be a, again a good thesis this is the cat neuron if you I guess you have to squint to see the cat there but you can sort of see it yeah no, it's there if you squint you'll see it I think what they would love is to get um, uh, a picture of Halle Berry in one of these neurons and then they <laughs> I guess this is Halle Berry a uh, cat woman <laughs> Of course, and these are the images that cause that neuron to fire all the kitties in YouTube. Interestingly, there's a mouse here too. <laughs> That's somewhat suspect. <laughs> Despite all this, um, if they look at the accuracy, and 100% is the best you could get. Uh, this is the accuracy of this net, 15.8%. But it's state of the art. Um, and this is in a competition that's actually quite large. It's in a competition that involves about 16 million images into 20,000 categories. And in fact, humans actually can do badly there as well. I don't know what the rate is for humans. I'd love to know. The vision guys, image net, humans. Probably what, 40, 60 percent? No idea. Okay, we'll, we'll look it up. That's a good thing to find out. Let's look up what, how, I, I've seen the figures somewhere, but I forget. Um, but it's a very hard task. So even doing 16, 15.8 percent is not bad. Um, there is a cartoon. If any of you have, has it, I know that people have emailed it to me. It's one of those XKCD or something like that. Where it, it's, a, it's a joke about this about all these layers, all this work, and at the end of the day, it's just a little bit better than random. But uh, um, it keeps getting better. When you do this in speech, it's a different story. And so vision, of course, doing, uh, solving the vision problem is not easy. I should say, solving the object recognition problem, because vision is about more than object recognition. In fact, for me, knowing that this is a plane, and when the, a hole is there that I shouldn't step on that hole, being able to detect and understand 3D structure is perhaps more important than being able to recognize what each thing is. 
spiders are very good at creating. Spiders have like layers of eyes, sort of, and they're able to get whole 3D maps of the world um, that allow them to navigate and detect where the prey is, attack the prey, they can do object recognition. So even a little tiny spider is able to do a lot of very complex um, vision uh, without having to have the, all these semantic categories. So vision is sort of a much more general problem and we still need to solve the, unfortunately that more general problem is something that's less relevant to Google at present, but um, except for the car. Um, but it's nonetheless still a big challenge in vision. Um, for object recognition, it's very hard. Speech is a bit easier. So in speech, Google has actually made huge progress, not on <coughs> Google, but also Microsoft using deep nets. Is this um, accuracy limited by just how many neurons they can train? Or is there a Excellent question. Um, if you ask some people, they, they would tell you, we need more data, we need a bigger net. This is part of the reason why I believe Jeff Hinton is moving to work with Google. Uh, well, you need more data, you need a bigger network, and you need more programmers <laughs> building this for you. Because um, each of these little details involves a lot of coding. Um, the code for this is all available, by the way. Um, for some of the recent competitions, um, especially the stuff I'm going to talk about now, Dropout Nets, it's code that you can download. And in fact, I, um, Baba emailed it to me and I shared it in the Google group. So you can each download this code. OK. In the remaining seven minutes, I'm going to describe uh, one new idea that sort of has made, um, that's sort of been very hot. And if you take Jeff Hinton's course online, um, you, you know, you'll definitely um, be preached on the value of this technique. Um, so it's a very cute technique. So it's called dropout. And dropout has allowed people who build neural networks to win many competitions. There's the Kaggle competitions. And by now, most of you should know what Kaggle is. If you don't know, um, make sure you visit this website. Kaggle is this website that just has data for machine learning competitions. And often there's prizes with the data. There's like $3 million is one prize and so on. But be careful. Because when you're solving one of these problems, you're solving a problem for, for a company. And their intent might not be a very good one. So be very careful. Especially that $3 million, do it with, make sure you research before you give them a solution. Um, OK, so this particular problem where they were successful consisted of, of um, a two, two challenges. One is classification and one is detection. So classification is you're basically given an image. You just want to say whether the object is present in the image or not. And then detection, actually, you have to say where in the image is the object. And you do it by putting one of these yellow boxes. So you say, for example, in the second image, this is where the chairs are. In the first image, this is where the duck is. And the categories that they had is sort of simpler. It's 20 uh, categories. And they basically had person, bird, cat, cow, bicycle, airplane. And for some reason, the computer vision people love these. And they always use these same categories. Chairs are very hard, though because there's all sorts of shapes of colors, textures of chairs. So it's a functional uh, object. And these were the results in classification. The neural networks achieved an error rate of uh, 0.15, which is considerably lower than the best techniques from computer vision. Which achieve, so if you look at the computer vision techniques, they're all fighting for that 0.26. Um, the, some groups from Oxford and so on, and I guess Xerox um, and RIA, they're all around the 0 0.20, high 20s. And these other guys just basically half the error just by building this neural network. So it's kind of hot. Um, well, I was in Oxford a couple of weeks ago. One of the things I did there was like immediately when they knew I was there, they knew, okay, there's a guy that knows about dropout here. Um, 
I spent, they spent quite a bit of time asking me questions about dropout and why does it work and how do we get to implement. So other people that do traditional computer vision and the Oxford group is one of the best at it in the world. Um, they're definitely very interested in these neural networks now because they've realized that they've, they complete them fair, they, they did beat them fair and square right, by a huge margin. Um, same in object detection. Okay. The other techniques involve a lot of engineering, many years of engineering. The neural nets, uh, you could argue they all involve, involve many years of engineering, but it's a very different path. You're engineering them to learn as opposed to engineer them specifically for a few images. Okay, so to finish this, dropout. Um, dropout is the following idea. Um, Jeff, and here I'm using some slides from um, a, a summer school that we taught at UCLA last year. Um, some of these guys went to it. Uh, they were there, um, Bob and Maria. Um, Another reason to do machine learning, right? <laughs> they spent a few days there at the beach and eating big plates of meat at the <laughs> place that Bob had found. Um, okay, so Jeff says that um, in order to win many competitions, and, and this is something that we've found in many competitions like the Netflix trend prize and so on, people put together ensembles of techniques. And we've, in this course, learned about this. Random forest is one such ensemble technique. You put many um, things together, you tend to get better predictions. When you did importance sampling, the predictor, the Bayesian predictor, also takes an average of many individual predictors. So, because essentially you're replacing an integral by an average, and the prediction of logistic, Bayesian logistic regression is actually a combination of predictors. The, com the type of combinations is different, though. And like Jeff says here, the connect uses bagging, which is essentially what, what we did when we did random forests. Bagging means adding many different models. There's different ways you could combine. You could do the, um, the arithmetic mean, 0.3 plus 0.1 divided by 2. That's what we did with random forests. But I could have also taken the geometric mean, you know, multiplied and taken the square root. So there's more than one way of averaging. That's his first point. Um, as we will see later, he will use the second form of averaging. Now, the way he does bagging, because essentially Jeff, what Jeff Hinton is going to do is very similar to a random forest, but with a neural net. And what he's going to do is Consider a specific layer of the network. And suppose you're training this network online. So you're loading a mini batch of data, of say 10 points. So you load a mini batch. And in fact, that mini batch could be just one point. So it could be just online gradient descent. You take one data point, you load one data point into memory. And then what you do then, instead of training the whole neural network on that data point, all the weights, you sample um, at random half of the units. And you only change the weights in the direction of the gradient for half of the units. For the other half, you don't do anything. You leave them, you freeze the weights. And then at the next iteration, when you load a new data point, you repeat this sampling. So in a way, it's kind of like random forest, where we're randomizing the features that we choose. We're only, say, taking half of the features. And he not only randomizes layer one, but he'll also randomize layer two. And in fact, he randomizes the input. So you only take half of the input features. Of course, because you're using, so whether you take them or not, um, is a binary decision, and if there are h units, there will be two to the h uh, possibilities or model structures that we sample. Okay, because you're only using one data point uh, for each sample, um, he argues that this is an extreme form of bagging. So it's 
so I, I think I mentioned to you guys that when we do bagging, um, traditional people just will subsample n data from n data so they will get repeats. Some people take say square root n or, or, or smaller uh, sizes. Um, in this case it's been quite extreme because it's only taken one data point for each randomization of the weights. Um, and then Jeff argues that this actually does regularization and it's better at doing regularization than using L1 and L2 norms. Um, and the reason is the following. Although in their paper, I should warn you, in their paper they do have something equivalent to an L2 regularizer in addition to this trick. So when you read all these papers, always be skeptical uh, because th these are concepts that we, we still are learning. So even the most experienced, smartest researchers often um, get the wrong intuitions or the wrong results. Um, the intuition for this is as follows. Think back to the RBF functions. Because a neural network is essentially a linear combination of basis functions. And let's think of the case where we have three bases. One basis, two bases, and three bases. One basis is located at four, one at two, and one at one. So that's one, two, and four. Now, what happens here is you would like to have those bases located there. That would give you a nice fit, right? So if each basis was at one of the modes, it would give you a good fit to the data. But in practice, when we do machine learning, what we often happen is we learn that the best, we might learn that the ideal bases are bases that look like this, one here, one here, and then one that goes here. 